Hello and welcome to our webcast today. I'm Dallas Brown, Chopra Center Certified Instructor, and I'm so thrilled to be here with Nirmala Reniga, Director and Founder of the Chopra Addiction and Wellness Center up in Squamish, British Columbia, up in Canada, an absolutely beautiful place to be located and to do healing work. So Nirmala, thank you and welcome today. Thank you, Dallas, and um, it's a pleasure to be here. Maybe we can begin with a short peace chant before we get into our subject. Absolutely, the best way to start anything, in my opinion. So I invite you and the viewers to take a deep breath in through your nose and release. Take another deep breath in. And as you release, just let go of any stress or tension. One more breath in. And as you release, just come to this present moment. Om Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotiregamaya Mrityorma Amritam Gamaya Om Shanti 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 Lead us from untruth to truth. Lead us from darkness to light. Lead us from fear of death to knowledge of immortality. Peace, peace, peace. When it's comfortable, please gently open your eyes. Thank you, Nirmala. That was beautiful. And actually quite a perfect way for us to start our dialogue today, which is really about the opposite of peace and about something that can disturb our peace and does for so many people, especially in this winter season. And, and that's addiction. And addiction is something that you have made not only a career of, but a calling in working with people who are struggling with all kinds of addiction. Can you tell me a little bit about that? When we think about addiction, Dallas, um, we all are addicted to something. We all have something where that keeps us um, in a place of comfort. For some, addiction is a way of coping, coping the emotional pain a trauma from the past. And there's different ways uh, people do cope. There's addiction to substances, alcohol or drugs, addictive behaviors like gambling, sex addiction, food addiction, internet addiction, which is these days quite big. And um, often we see people spiral down into depression suffer from anxiety, have panic attacks, also um, post-traumatic stress disorder. So there's a lot of things that can keep us unwell. And what some of these behaviors or substance sometimes help, it helps a person keep them sane, even though it's insanity to be addicted, but on some level it kept them safe uh, in a place or in a way that they could still be living, but there has been no joy, there's been no peace, the life, the life has been chaotic, and often if you think about somebody who's addic addicted to a substance or alcohol, or any of the behaviors, there's a lot of shame, there's a lot of guilt, that they are always actually are pretending to be somebody they are not. Mm. It does seem that way that as many people that there are who struggle with addiction 
openly there are as many or more who struggle with it very privately and who for feelings of shame or fear of losing their way of life or their reputation or whatever things that they hold dear choose to suffer in in silence that's actually quite common isn't it yes i mean often we our focus goes to people who use uh, alcohol and drugs because it's very visual and we can see the damage for example somebody who drinks um, we can know that they're drinking mm -hmm. and when they're at, at home their behavior may be irrational sometimes so that's quite visual but when you're looking at someone who may be in uh, internet addiction food addiction or uh, some of the other behaviors because it's acceptable we don't think mm -hmm. uh, that they have a problem however these behaviors, behaviors affect their relationship to themselves and to others around them. Sure. Just what you're saying makes me think of people who have uh, perhaps addictive behaviors around exercise or relationships, things that on the surface are not as damaging as somebody who's using substances. But in fact, the mechanisms that happen in the body and the way that addiction can take you away from your true self are, are really quite similar. Yes, we actually, what, what tends to happen in addiction is the person, the identity is lost. So when you for a moment think of someone, a child who witnessed certain behaviors growing up in the household with an alcoholic parent, they witness trauma. And so when the child grows up, or even at a younger age, what the child may do is because of the pain, the emotional pain, and the fear of not being able to express the true emotions to anybody on the outside. And sometimes we have to pay attention to listen to little kids telling us a story. We try and push it away because we don't want to believe it as adults. But those stories are can become a life-damaging experience for that individual mm -hmm. if it's not validated. For example, if the child in the school system or as they were growing up came across a substance or behavior that actually kept them from not feeling all the emotions, they grow up into um, someone, or someone who's addicted because they were not able to freely express the emotions or heal from it. So this journey is about healing from all your emotional pain and we all have experiences. Some of us are able to get through these experiences in a way because we have good support system. We have grown up in an environment where we were practicing certain tools. But for most of, our, most of us or most people out there, this is not available. And because that support and those tools are not there, they really know only one way to feel safe which is being in their behavior or feeling. And the other thing is there's always a disconnection between the mind and body. The body has experienced something and the mind does not want to go there because the memory is too painful. So the addictive behavior then becomes a coping mechanism That's to right. avoid that, that experience or that memory that was too painful. Yes. So there's been you know, various standardized Western treatments for addiction for many, many years. And we think of all of these, all of these centers and programs and all of the things that are available. But, but the Chopra Addiction and Wellness Center that you run actually has a very different philosophy than what you might see at a mainstream addiction facility. Can you speak a little bit about the, the differences and why you've chosen to take such an such a alternative approach? I will start this with uh, sharing a story. Back in 1990s when I was working um, or running the outpatient addiction clinic that uh, specializes with uh, people who use heroin, opiates, I used to see people from all walks of life where they either were from the street, we would see people who had jobs, I would sometimes see nurses, I would see a wide range of um, people uh, struggling in addiction. And um, providing just 
uh, a treatment like in, in the case of Sarah uh, opiate dependency, methadone is a accepted treatment. People needed more than that. And there are re residential treatment centers out there. And a lot of the uh, centers are based on this 12-step model, 12-step philosophy, where it's all about stopping the, the drug and um, attending meetings. 12-step is a great philosophy. However, it may not be for everyone. Remember that treatment centers do save countless number of lives, so does 12-step meeting. But it's not only about stopping to use a substance or stopping a behavior. Addiction or healing from addiction or behaviors is actually healing the body and mind and spirit and integrating. And the process that involves is not only the, um, the therapeutic clinical work with individual or group counseling or group session, but also body work. That means having a massage. Our skin is the largest organ. And if you imagine if you were a child and you were sexually abused, your relationship to the to touch can be very traumatic. Sure. And so what needs to happen is as you're healing, we introduce safe touch through massage. So the person can start feeling comfortable in their own body, in their own skin, because it was so intrusive. Mm -hmm. Practices like yoga allows the person to come in the present moment. Yoga is not just about doing practices. As you know, the, the teachings of Sage Patanjali in the Yoga Sutras, there's eight limbs of yoga. And some of this is incorporated in our philosophy at the, ten, at the center, where we look at um, what is the yam, the yama, which is the, our behaviors on the outside, mm -hmm. the niyama, which is personal observances, who we are when nobody's looking. And this is where addiction and addictive behaviors take place, is when we are in our personal space when nobody's watching us. Sure. And then we move to um, asana, which is the practice, the exercise movement. And we come to breathing techniques. And breathing, pranayam, is so important, especially when we think of those people who have anxiety. We often forget to breathe. Yes. And any, any person who is struggling, actually, if they took a few moments and just paid attention to simply breathing, witnessing their breath. It will bring them in that moment. Often we t have a tendency to be either in the past, which is um, a story, or trapped in that story, that hamster wheel, or in the future, the uncertainty. And pranayama and yoga and meditation actually brings us to be more present. The other thing is pratyahara, which is uh, the five senses, uh, withdrawing our senses. Often what we see out there in the environment has a direct impact on our emotions. So when we become aware of our senses, we are able to not go into fight or flight, but really come from a place of restful awareness. Mm -hmm. Then comes the dharana, which is um, attention or concentration or focus. When we start looking at um, what's going around us, and if we want to incorporate some sort of a practice, it requires us to, to bring attention to it. For example, meditation. And um, cultivating that practice is a process. And then comes the dhyana, which is meditation, that going in a place of silence. And silence actually allows us to get in touch with our higher self. And often we find at the center when guests are practicing med meditation all the time, they actually stay on the path to recovery and they report that the only the times they relapse is they had dropped their meditation or stopped doing the med meditation. Wow, that's fascinating. And then, of course, the last is uh, samadhi or transcendence. And this is the place where if we are really practicing all the tools, that we can experience that joy, that really feeling, feeling of um, 
that happiness we talk about just being who we are because often we don't like who we are and this is actually set up in a way which is even from the society and our own self our own negative thought patterns that actually bring us to a place of not wanting to be who we are and we need to start embracing we all have unique gifts we all have unique qualities and we can harness this to heal ourselves and be an an instrument to help others who may be suffering in this society i just i love bringing in the the eight limbs of yoga into the philosophy of treating addiction and of healing because it's so it really is so complete and so perfect and it, it addresses all of the different aspects that human beings really need to to be healthy to be healed to be whole and you know it seems the biggest difference besides bringing in eastern philosophies into the the teachings at your center in meditation which you know we the more we learn about the benefits of meditation i think the harder and harder it's getting for anybody at home to say oh this is not for me or i shouldn't be doing this it's just truly overwhelming but it's also very important at the addiction center it's not like you said just about stopping whatever that addictive behavior is because then you're left with an emptiness or a hole it's really about filling filling that up returning to that true state of wholeness which isn't the absence of an addiction or an addictive behavior but it's actually something much greater it's true fulfillment absolutely i mean we you know when when i see guests come into the center the first time the first day or in the first week we see them so broken we see uh, the pain in their eyes but through the the integrated approach we have a center physician and a nurse and there is a very solid clinical team therapist who do the healing work very slowly even if you if we get into the first week or the week after and if i sit with them in the group i can see a definite shift a definite change i remember a story of this woman who came to us this is about almost 3 years ago she was in her 60s severe depression mind you she didn't um, speak to us on the phone the only way we communicated was was via, via email she showed up to the center and initially for 4 weeks and she kept her face down all the time engaged very little in the first few weeks she made a decision to stay extend her stay to 6 weeks and in the 5th in the 6th week in the groups she was the person leading the group almost because she learned from the therapeutic work that she was worthy that she had that knowledge that she had those skills and that she was able to express herself without feeling that rejection without feeling that fear and often it's that fear that keeps us trapped in that cycle absolutely and i think especially at this time this winter season with the holidays and the darkness the coldness here in the northern hemisphere the reflecting on another year that's gone by many people have a tendency to see their their addictive behaviors worsen or their depression worsen or feelings of hopelessness can be quite common during this time and and because it's such an isolated experience I, i imagine sadly that there are people who are listening to us or watching us right now who are either experiencing this themselves or who have close family members or friends who are experiencing addiction what what would you offer them you're right this is a very challenging time for a lot of people especially during the holiday season we think of families having fun parties and those who may be in recovery are, are cautious or may not want to show up at a party because they may relapse there's a lot of stories that play out in our minds my advice to those who are listening would be is first of all come from a place of compassion for yourself and if there's family members who have somebody who's struggling 
have more compassion for them and come from a place of non-judgment. We are human beings, we will make mistakes, but that's not end of the road. Try and go, try and just live in the moment to see what is going on. If you are feeling overwhelmed, maybe you'd want to reach out to a friend or someone who is going to support you. There are a lot of resources out there that can help you. And it's sometimes a phone call away is just trying to reach out to someone who may support you when you're struggling. Some of the things one may want to do is, um, at this time of the year, we also indulge in, indulge in food, uh, junk food. It's just being, just being aware of um, when you're around people, or when you're around parties, the food. It's better to have a good meal from home than to show up to a place empty stomach and just just filling yourself up. Mm. So it's I think bringing more awareness of who, of where we are, who are with, and our surrounding. When you um, bring that awareness in, that's when you start making those mindful choices or conscious choices. What is nourishing for me? Often we tend to gravitate towards things that will provide us comfort, but really that's self-medicating. So, you know, the big word is compassion, self-care, mm -hmm. going for a massage, you know, massage is so nourishing, taking walks, um, you know, if it's dark, having some more light in your place, maybe having a lamp that allows you not to feel depressed and um, listen, do the 21-day meditation experience, repeat it. I think there's one which is on perfect health. There's several of the 21 days meditation that I think one can bring about and just listening. I think just listening to meditation each day and uh, bringing an intention in that I want a joyful, energetic, beautiful body. I love what you're saying because these are not um, expensive or grand or impossible gestures. These are really small steps that any of us can do every day to just bring a little bit more love and compassion and ease into this season and, and to help carry us through. And I, I do want to ask you about this, um, about this shame. How can we reduce the shame around addiction? How can we help families to embrace each other a little bit more? I think you know, that compassion, that recognition that we're all human and that we make mistakes is, is so important. But is there anything else that people can, can do to provide themselves with some comfort? Forgiveness is a very important word, forgiveness. I feel that, um, you know, if we do come from a place of non-judgment, knowing that like I said before, that we would make mistakes, we would make choices which are sometimes not nourishing or healthy for us. I think having a conscious communication, open communication, and if you frame it in a way that the person who's struggling, that you know you do care, you do love them, and come from, uh, come from un unconditional love, I think that goes a long way, unconditional love, non-judgment, compassion, support, all this actually opens the door for a person uh, to heal and also reduce their shame because now they are um, embraced with the negative qualities or the ne negative experiences they are having. Yeah, these are good reminders for all of us, right? And, and also that we don't know what somebody is experiencing. So always leading with compassion and love. Can, uh, can really make the difference for somebody. So that's, those are all really wonderful tips. And you know, you, you've been in addiction, working in this field for 30 years. You've worked with Dr. Deepak Chopra and the late Chopra Center co-founder, Dr. David Simon, for a very long time. And you've, in a very unique way, brought both of their, their teachings, these two physicians who have done so much work on healing and spirituality and connection into the context of addiction and created just absolutely the most beautiful, peaceful space in, 
in British Columbia to do this healing work and and people are coming and they're experiencing truly profound changes. I'm always blown away when I read through any of the testimonials of guests that have gone through your programs and I think it's it's quite clear that this is a methodology that is really helping people. The uh, the program which um, David Dr. David Simon was instrumental in, and of course, uh, Dr. Chopra, and of course, with the, our clinical team, we, we know and we understand that the body has to heal, and it has to be in a safe environment. So we have created a safe space for them to do the deeper level of healing, because it's not just about stopping the behavior. It's going to those dark, secret places where you have sort of locked, locked the box and threw away the, away the key because it was uh, so painful. And just one more thing I wanted to say was that um, just recently I completed um, recording and re uh, released my album Meditation and Introduction, which is also a great tool. And if um, you know people want to have a meditation practice or want to learn how to meditate, this is meditation made simple, mm -hmm. and it just provides them with some um, guidelines and some very small, some very short meditation that they could use uh, first thing in the morning when they get up, just listen to it, and have an intention, have an intention for the day. Let me get through this day without having to indulge in substances or behaviors so that I can experience and be present and enjoy my day. Sure, sure, that sounds really wonderful. Yeah, we definitely encourage everybody to, uh, to check that out. And if anybody who's listening is experiencing addiction themselves or depression or has someone that they love and they're concerned about, I understand that your team is available to connect and to support and you have a variety of different services available. How does somebody get in touch with the Chopra Addiction and Wellness Center? Firstly, they can call us. Our number is 1-888-802-3001 or they can send us an email at info at chopratreatmentcenter.com and even they can go on the website, chopratreatmentcenter.com, and send us an email via the contact us form. All the emails or messages are confidential. We believe that um, privacy and confidentiality is very important in the, the role or the part of a healing process. And unless the person is ready to share with others, I think this is the personal and private journey. However, family can also make that call, family members, and families also sometimes, well, families also need to heal. Sometimes we send a loved one to a treatment center. They do all the healing work and come back, but the family still is the same. Mm -hmm. And um, a person may relapse because there's this expectation that uh, for them to, uh, it's like if you have been using alcohol for 20, 30, 40 years, you go to a 28-day facility and come back and uh, everything should be perfect. Sure. Well, 28 days is just the beginning of a journey. It's just the beginning of your journey. So do you, does your center also offer some support services for the families as well? Yes, part of the program is when somebody comes for four to six weeks, we include a family session. The, uh, the family member can show up and do therapeutic work on one of the weekends with the guest. The other way is it can be done through Skype or also uh, on the phone, but also respecting the individual. Sometimes a person may not want to do that therapeutic work with their family. Sure. So we as a center have to respect. But w as a center, we feel that the family and when the guests do the work, then there's better understanding and there's greater support when they go back because now they're going back to a place which is their home and that's where the wholeness begins. Yeah. And when they have the support and the love and the, 
non-judgment and compassion, the recovery goes a long way. That makes sense, of course, that, yeah, family could play that role. I guess that is absolutely, absolutely the ideal. And of course, every healing journey is so different. So, so I want to thank everybody who's, who's joined us today for this dialogue. And, and Nirmal, I especially want to thank you for, for being with us and for all of the work you do to support so many people in, in really some of the hardest times of their life. Uh, going through addiction and and healing and going through recovery is um, is not an easy an easy task and you hold um, you hold a light and a very compassionate loving embrace for for many hundreds of people who have gone through this experience and I really honor you and and really want to thank you for that so thank you Nirmala thank you Dallas it's uh, you know again a pleasure this is um something I just love to do, passion, it's a passion of mine. When I started this journey back in uh, late 80s, you know, I didn't even know what addiction was. But my learning has come through being around people who were struggling. And it feels like yesterday that I started this journey. It feels that 30 years has not passed. And, um, you know, again, gives me tremendous joy to see people heal. So thank you. And it's, it's my privilege and honor to share the teachings um, with, and, and hoping that anybody who's struggling out there will reach out, whether it's to us or any of the centers, and take that first step to heal. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's the key is just reaching out. No, none of us have to go through it alone. So thank you. And again, thanks to everybody who is here with us today. And we're wishing you all a very safe and healthy and warm winter season. Thank you all for being with us today. And um, I'm hoping that uh, whatever Dallas and I spoke today will allow you to make some healthy choices and connections in your life. Wishing you all the best.